Hello, and welcome to the fourth webinar in a series about ocean sewage pollution. My name is Kristen Mays. I'm with the Reef Resilience Network, and I'm your host for this webinar. The Ocean Sewage Series is presented by the Nature Conservancy with support from the Reef Resilience Network and NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program. Special thanks for joining us for this rescheduled webinar, and um, big apologies for any inconvenience the postponement may have caused. Unfortunately, the GoToWebinar system went down last week, so we were unable to hold the webinar. Long Island Sewage Story Part 2 is the second half of a two-part webinar about a 10-year effort to tackle the nitrogen pollution issue on Long Island, New York. Our presenters, Stuart Lowry and Chris Clapp, are joining us from the Nature Conservancy's New York chapter. Stuart is the Water Priority Director, and Chris is the Water Quality and Public Policy Specialist. During the webinar, Stuart and Chris will continue describing their recipe for impactful and enduring conservation that they began sharing about during part one of the webinar. As a recap, this recipe includes good science, adaptive strategies, technological innovation, social science to change behavior, partnerships, new funding streams, and policy initiatives. Today, we'll focus on the role of partnerships, financing, tactics to build support, and the durable changes they've achieved so far. If you missed part one of the story, the recording is on the Reef Resilience Network webinars page. The link is on the slide here, and we'll go ahead and share that link with you now via the, the chat box. As a reminder, the Reef Resilience Network is developing, we're developing resources for managers to address the threat of ocean sewage pollution. So in addition to this webinar series, we're creating web pages on the Reef Resilience Network toolkit, case studies highlighting sewage monitoring and management strategies, and an online course to help managers build understanding on this topic and the ways that they can act. A couple quick housekeeping items before we begin. Today's webinar will be one hour. Following the presentations from Stuart and Chris, we'll have a discussion session. There are two ways you can ask questions during that session. You can type your question into the question box during the session or really at any time during the presentation. So if something comes to mind, feel free to share that with us for the question and answer session. Um, or you can raise your hand. There's a little hand icon just next to your name on your um, toolkit. And if you click that, we can call on you unmute you, you can unmute yourself, and you can ask your question aloud yourself. If you're having any technical difficulties, such as trouble hearing or seeing the slides, please send us a message in that same question box, and we'll do our best to resolve the issue. Thank you again for joining us, and Chris and Stuart, thank you so much for joining, sharing about the story, and, and persevering due to the postponement. So, Stuart, I will now pass it over to you to, to kick us off. All right, I'm assuming that Chris has control of the slides. So we're picking up sort of where we left. You can go to the next slide. Next slide. So a very, very quick review. When we last spoke with you, we talked about essentially how to create enabling conditions for the change that you need in order to stop nutrient pollution. And the U.S. Water Alliance provides this really helpful diagram for thinking through the different places you need to work in order to get a shift in the paradigm that you're operating in. How do you change the status quo? And in the first presentation, we talked about creating enabling conditions by enhancing the culture and knowledge within our organization and outside of it. And we started, we talked about building citizen and stakeholder engagement. Central to both these ideas was uh, social science research. So we went uh, into some of the social science work focus groups and uh, polling that we have done on Long Island to try to uncover the changed messages that resonated with our target audiences and get them ready to use across Long Island. So I want to emphasize something here before I go any further, and that is that each of you has to answer the questions posed in this diagram um, for a paradigm shift for your own circumstances. 
And the challenges that you're confronting are going to be at a different scale and a different nature than the ones we confronted on Long Island. But I think that the model for paradigm shift that's embedded here is useful at many scales and in many different jurisdictions. So I encourage you to think about your circumstances and fit the solutions that you need to the universe of what is possible. And don't get too discouraged when we talk about large sums of money. Long Island is a very wealthy place. The problems cost a lot of money to fix, and we were able to access that money. In many places, the problems don't cost a lot to fix, and the places are not wealthy. So scale the solution to the available resources. All right, next slide. We also talked last time about um, critical path. So this is basically blocking out for your reference as a roadmap what are the challenges that you confront? And we confronted that list of challenges in the rainbow strip across the bottom. These are all the things that we needed to have in place in some way in order to move the needle towards the solutions that, uh, that we needed towards reduction in nutrient pollution. So you'll see nitrogen loading uh, reductions. We needed to know what the targets were. We needed technology. We needed the changes in rules and regulations that forbid the use of the te technology that we wanted. We needed money. We needed governance innovation. And those were all barriers. And within the critical path, we had lots of different incremental changes in, that we could push for that would move the needle towards the removal of each of those barriers. So that's the critical path. It's sort of like a theory of change, but it's a little bit different. All right, so next slide. The last piece of what we talked about in the first session was getting your messages out there and building the change narrative that is necessary so that the target audiences begin to move in your direction and you've normalized a different way of doing business. So our message triangle derived from social science pointed the way forward to communicate about this. I want to say one small thing about this, which is you see that word nitrogen pollution in the middle of the message triangle. Nitrogen pollution as a concept did not exist on Long Island 10 years ago. You never saw it in the media. Nobody would have any idea what you were talking about if you mentioned it. Now, after we've been out there working the media and working our partners, working with other NGOs, this phrase, nitrogen pollution appears in any article that you read on Long Island about the, uh, the nutrient problems that we have in our near shore waters. So a huge triumph. We changed the narrative and we moved it in the direction of you want to fix the problem, you have to go after nitrogen. All right, so let's go on to what we're going to talk about today. Next slide. We want to figure out how we take action. Um, and there are three, four more boxes in the paradigm shift diagram that we're going to go after. Creating bold leadership, planning and collaboration, working with partners and getting things to, to happen differently. Altering the rules and regulations and the, the legislation that you're operating in. And then figuring out how you're going to pay for it, how you're going to build that durable um, economic universe that sustains the, the change that you need over time. So I want to emphasize here that there's no real sequence to this. Um, you work on each of these boxes as you're able to, again, thinking about your critical path. You, what are the changes you need to see? What are the incremental pushes that you can make to make some of these changes happen? They're all necessary. They're all interrelated, interrelated and they're all dependent one on another. But that doesn't mean that you are helpless to take a starting uh, effort. So I'll give you an example. For example, um, a leader will likely only emerge if there's a clear, effective means of moving forward to the change state that you want to see. So everything's connected. Well, so let's talk a little bit about bold leadership. Next slide. Bold leadership at the right scale and in the right place and time may not simply happen organically on Long Island. We used pretty hard duty, heavy duty campaign strategies to try to set up safety for bold leaders, particularly people high up in the political food chain, to step up and lead on this issue. It wasn't a natural place for them to go. Um, so when we, we had our message triangle solidly in place, 
we decided that we would take a leap of faith and we made a small investment in a cable news, a cable uh, advertising campaign. Uh, and we thought that would get attention. It sure did. Uh, after we ran that ad for about six weeks, all of a sudden people were scattering around trying to figure out who was running this ad, why were they running this ad about water quality challenges on Long Island, um, what did they want? And shortly after that, um, the paper of record for Long Island, the uh, Long Island Newsday, ran a, a weeks long worth of, of front page coverage on the water quality challenges in Long Island. And they also ran a, uh, uh, a TV news editorial for uh, five days in a row talking about the different aspects of the water quality challenge. This was huge. It transformed the landscape and it set the stage for the county executive who has the control of the regulatory world and the purse strings for the area we're in to step to the plate. So next slide. So after we did our ad campaign, after Newsday came out and supported our ad campaign with its investigative reporting on the front page, the county executive stepped to the plate and uh, Chris, maybe you can punch the button and people can hear what the county exec said about water quality. Or maybe not. No work. That's all right. So what the county exec said to our amazement and great satisfaction was nitrogen pollution is the number one threat to water in in Suffolk County. And he was making it the highest priority of his administration to deal with nitrogen pollution. A giant leap forward. We had a bold leader. my apologies that that audio worked on my end so hopefully if you're able to um download the presentation maybe it was because i was still on mute that that wasn't able to be heard can you all see, still see the slides okay um so again bold leadership not only comes from the top but it also comes from uh, within your agencies and within those who are responsible for actually drafting codes that make change happen and managing the change that needs to be ha needs to happen. And there was a lot of doubt or what you might want to call deniers or doubters uh, within the leadership of the agencies that would have to manage the program, which we hoped they would set up. And they were the probably the biggest um, blockers of change at that point in time. We had the leadership of the county exec in place, but the leaders in the health department were still reluctant to accept um, any change uh, of technology that needed to be brought into play to solve our problem. So what we did was we worked with the county and we organized a tour of other states along the eastern seaboard of the United States to um, meet with regulators who had been wrestling with this same problem uh, and this same um, and the same solutions for um, the last several decades and had begun programs of their own to overcome that. And what was uh, really interesting about this tour was the, the um, agency leads that were responsible for managing the programs, as I said, were, were real doubters. By the end of day one, after visiting some regulators in Maryland, um, you know, it became a question of, okay, it's not if this could happen, it, it is when this could happen. By the end of day two, after visiting folks in New Jersey and Rhode Island, uh, it was, wow, there's a real opportunity for this to happen in our geography. By the end of day three, with a stop at um, the Massachusetts 
Alternative Septic System Test Center, that's what MASTIC stands for on the left-hand side of the screen, it was, wow, there's not only just one technology that, that can do this, but a whole bunch, and they actually work. So within a three-day period of time, those folks that were uh, um, not convinced of the solutions, they were concerned about managing their own program uh, and being liable for that program. Now, within a few days of interacting with their peers in other states and hearing from what they had learned through their experiences with these technologies and programs, um, had, had fully accepted and become leaders of their own. It is also worth noting that the folks who, who took that tour now host tours of their own for other geographies to come to Suffolk County to tour some installations, to listen to how uh, codes have been changed and how priorities are set. So a, a really fantastic turn of events where those who were once doubters now become leaders, not only within their own agencies and within their own jurisdictions, but within the region to educate others that find themselves in the position they were in uh, five or 10 years ago. Additionally, what leaders do uh, is they never waste an opportunity uh, to take advantage of a, a crisis or a disaster. Uh, the New York region, New York, New Jersey region of the Eastern Seaboard was hit extremely hard by Hurricane Sandy. And um, many of much of our infrastructure was uh, terribly impacted. Uh, and the state agencies, uh, having adopted some of the science that uh, the Nature Conservancy and our partners had been doing for a long time, made the connection between healthy coastal ecosystems and resilient shorelines. And, and, the, and then made the further connection of nitrogen pollution impacting those natural resources, and thereby were set themselves up to uh, create funds and um, quickly move funds that would advance projects to um, increase the capacity and uh, efficiency of existing infrastructure and expand infrastructure to other areas uh, where it did not exist. Also, as part of the Hurricane Sandy relief money was a uh, major nutrient loading uh, reduction in the Great South Bay to the west of the area that was shown before, uh, in told uh, some 700 to $2 billion of infrastructure funds were put forth. Stuart. Building out plans, plans are not very often implemented as they are written, but it's really important to remember that the process of making a plan and the collaboration that goes into making a plan is useful on its own merits. And plans can generate recommendations that can be used to unify people and get people focused in on taking action. So um, not to be poo-pooed and walked away from is the whole effort of planning. So planning can happen and collaboration can happen at small levels and large levels. Next slide. We decided that we wanted to walk the walk in the world of implementation so we stepped to the plate, collaborated with the County of Suffolk, with the Suffolk County Legislature, with uh, the Stony Brook Clean Water Institute, and we installed some experimental technology at one of our facilities on Long Island so that people would have a, a new way of treating wastewater that they could monitor and verify. And uh, behind the people sitting there is a, uh, a natural artificial swale rather that takes up the nutrients from a uh, uh, disposal field right below at the roots of the plants right in the roots of the plants so so that's one small form of collaboration that builds credibility uh, you're you're walking the talk that you were telling everybody else they need to do and you're fixing your own uh, footprint it's very important and that's a small step but very powerful it's also important when planning efforts come along, next slide, 
to dive in with both feet. You never know, again, what recommendations you might get planted in a planning process as it comes to fruition and how you can leverage that planning process to build more collaboration amongst the people who can affect the solutions you're looking for. So one of the big uh, changes that we got was the state of New York stepping to the plate and saying, we hear all this noise on Long Island about nitrogen pollution. We're gonna fund the Long Island Nitrogen Action Plan that build recommendations for how we fix nitrogen pollution. A huge transformational moment for us and it pulled together the state the, and counties and the towns in, in a single planning effort to uh, build out the right sets of recommendations and to complete the science needed to solve the nutrient problem. Big progress, giant step forward for us. One of the outcomes of that planning effort was, next slide, the Suffolk County Subwatershed Wastewater Plan, which if you think back to the critical path I began to address a whole bunch of the challenges we had. How much nitrogen needs to come out of each watershed in order to achieve the possibility of restoration of the nearshore environment? This was the document that finally delivered those answers for us. So we were moving along that critical path. And so the subwatersheds, wastewater plan, hugely transformational, full of recommendations for what needs to be done, puts numbers on how much needs to come out in order to get the transformation, that system change that you're looking for. So a giant leap forward for us. Next slide. So what emerged from uh, at the end of this planning process uh, to us and to, to, to many others was a clear choice between two futures. One in which we continue to accept a degraded environment and require expensive treatment of our drinking water as the norm, or one in which we responsibly treat our wastewater before it enters the ground and surface waters. So we no longer have to treat the drinking water and have healthy productive surface waters uh, for future generations. You can see here on the left-hand side of the screen is the um, modeled impact to the aquifer of nitrate levels in the groundwater uh, if we were to do nothing. This is a tiny uh, um, township island uh, in between the two forks of uh, the eastern end of Long Island known as Shelter Island, uh, roughly 2,500 homes on the entire island. The blue area you see here on the um, southeast or the bottom right corner of your screen uh, is a preserve owned by the Nature Conservancy. So we've been in this community for a really long time and um, have been doing a lot of work there and they are entirely reliant upon private on-site wells for each home for their drinking water and they're also uh, almost ent they're entirely reliant upon um, on-site disposal systems, mostly just cesspools to dispose of their waste. There's one tiny um, sewer and water district um, on the upper left corner of the island there. Uh, only it encompasses a, a, a few dozen homes and businesses. Uh, but what you see here is what you really don't want to see are colors uh, warmer than the light green. Once you get into the yellows and above, even though the drinking water standard set by the EPA is 10 milligrams per liter of nitrate, serious health concerns can arise uh, above four milligrams per liter. And we know that uh, nitrate levels above two milligrams per liter have serious Im uh, implications for the coastal waters, inc including harmful algal blooms, fish kills, and uh, low dissolved oxygen. So what you see here on the left is if we do nothing, their nitrate levels continue to increase, uh, becomes almost undrinkable in many places. And if we were to act, very small portions of the island approach those levels. So this island we believe has a solvable problem. Uh, next slide, please. 
So regulations and legislation, uh, Stuart mentioned before how we work on all of the aspects of the one water paradigm shift uh, in concert, and they're all interrelated. Most, for the most part, regulations and legislation will not move forward without a solution. Many of those solutions require legislation to occur. Uh, and most leaders won't take action unless they could know that the solutions are affordable, so that requires some sort of finance uh, and e economics ahead of time. So these all need to move forward um, at the same time, even though they, you make progress on each one in uh, incremental parts. So our first major accomplishment was just getting the technologies that we needed uh, to solve our problem allowed for use in the county. They were explicitly um, called out in the health code as unallowable for use. And so that was our first uh, great accomplishment was getting the technologies we needed allowed for use in the county. And we were an integral part in working with uh, our partners in the county as well as partners region-wide to help them uh, see that way forward. Next slide, please. And even more recently, uh, we, we to, to many people's surprise, uh, here in 2020, you were still allowed to replace a cesspit with a cesspit. Uh, so they finally closed a 50-year-old loophole in the sanitary code that allowed for that um, replacement of in-kind um, polluting systems. Um, at first, we had to go town by town, it's one of those small municipalities, one at a time to create mandates as they had funding mechanisms that the larger county and the larger region did not. So we had to work within the, the municipalities that did have the uh, extra funding resources. Um, and then more recently, since those town by town mandates became into play where they were not allowing any conventional systems whatsoever, all new systems going in the ground had to be treatment units that reduced nitrogen. Uh, the county was almost forced to work with the towns to create a failure model by which if you had a uh, some sort of structural or hydraulic failure, uh, a team of sanitari a sanitarian from the county, uh, an engineer, and an installer would show up at your house within 24 hours and install the system, and they would figure out all the paperwork afterwards. Uh, and this has been a real savior to uh, preventing uh, repairs and replacements uh, in kind of polluting systems uh, that uh, are now being replaced with treatment units that reduce uh, nitrogen and other uh, pathogens and other contaminants of emerging concern. Next slide, please. And most recently, uh, as, as you can tell from the uh, face gear here, uh, a, the most recent change to the, the health code uh, after six years of, of proving technologies, figuring out financing, uh, educating an industry, uh, and really bringing along a diverse group of stakeholders, uh, they finally signed into law that all new construction and reconstruction in the county had to have uh, uh, these IA systems installed. Again, this is a, a, an example where you don't get the regulation without the finance and the leadership to see it over the finish line. Um, and for example, the just for the scale of magnitude, that's um, about 20 to 22,000 pounds of nitrate annually uh, compounding on itself a year to be avoided in the future. Next slide, please. And Stuart. Okay, so economics and finance is the uh, the last linchpin in that paradigm change daisy wheel. So let me say a few things about it. Uh, again, I've already alluded to the fact that the dollar value of the solution has to match the scale of the problem. 
on Long Island, the scale of the problem was huge. So the dollar value of fixing it was going to be very large. But it's really important to remember that on Long Island, the polluting septic systems in use everywhere were not a choice. When we started this work nine years ago, regulations and health codes required that these systems were be, would be used at re, in residences and in commercial places, and the regulations prohibited the use of residential clean water septic systems that Chris has been talking about. So the nitrogen pollution problem that was created by all of these residential septic systems happened through no fault of the property owners themselves really important thing to remember, they're not to be blamed. And when you have that circumstance, you wanna change something that wasn't somebody's fault, they didn't do anything wrong. It's really important to, to at least at the beginning, as you try to push your change solution out there, to subsidize it so that people don't feel like they're being punished for something they didn't, that they didn't do that was wrong. Um, so that was the, that was the track that we've taken since the beginning, that there should be no wipeouts for people because they didn't do things wrong. And we needed to subsidize this at, at least initially. And um, next slide, you build up towards this by finding the ways to create money. Um, in one instance, that meant changing an existing fund, a community preservation fund that collected a 2% real estate transfer tax in the five East End towns. We went back to the voters and asked them to modify that program so that 20% of that revenue could be used for clean water uh, projects, particularly for the uh, installation, the subsidized installation of uh, clean water septic technology. So that measure passed by, uh, collectively about a 75% margin. I'll remind you it happened in 2016 and in the United States, other things happening in 2016 were not anywhere near as positive as that result. So we were definitely uh, swimming upstream to get that kind of a result for conservation outcome that year. So that's made a huge difference for some of the towns and it sets a model for the county to step to the plate and for the state to step to the plate in order that people not feel like they're being punished for not having done anything that was wrong. So overall, next slide, uh, a lot of money has come to this program. There's still a big funding need, but uh, it comes in different ways. So important to remember that some, when a door opens for major water quality infrastructure funds at the national level or at the state level, be there with your hand out and ask for something that will help your particular program. And that's what we did when the Water Quality Infrastructure Fund was created in New York State. We said, how about some money for septic improvement programs? They put a $75 million line in and we've collected 10 million from that uh, appropriation for uh, Suffolk County. And most of that's actually already been expended. We're going back for more money of that 75 million. Um, that also queued up Suffolk County to continue stepping to the plate with its own funding, four million from their uh, premier conservation fund, the quarter percent drinking water protection fund, which is part of a sales tax. That's uh, ongoing every year, a couple of million dollars can go into that fund. Anyway, so the scope of the problem is 70 million a year for 20, 20 years. So we're still away from the full fix here but incrementally you create the momentum um, you get people to buy in you create the industry and you create the service sector that can install these things when you have certainty and when you have funding to pay for it and that's what we've been up to institutionalizing change so last slide so a real quick summary and lessons learned we're changing our nitrogen problem on Long Island by intentionally changing the wastewater management systems, the whole way that people think about wastewater. So the systems change is being accomplished by shifting the focus from symptoms to the sources. Instead of thinking about how do we make the bays healthy, we think about how do we stop the nitrogen that's killing the bays. We use social science to uncover, create, and amplify clean water messages with key target audiences. And this is the message box that the Reef Resilience Network uh, documents will train you on. 
We used our trusted role on Long Island to obtain science-based regulations and policies. We were able to integrate ourselves into all these planning efforts because we have been on Long Island as a, a conservation force for over 50 years. So we had credibility and people listened to us. Very important to leverage that in a moment like this. We campaigned successfully for clean water money at the ballot box, and we also served as lobbyists up in the state and in some of our local government arenas to get regulatory change and to get funding put into, put into play. So this process involves both staff, having people who know how to do it and who are available to do it, and volunteer leadership, people who are part of your organization as trustees or volunteers who will also uh, step to the podium and uh, put the messages out there. And a reminder that much of this change has occurred in economic downturns, such as the one we're in now. So even when money is tight, if people feel like there's a result here they really want, they'll help you fund it. Some lessons learned real quick, love the problem, not the solution. Don't get tied up in how you're gonna fix it, but get tied up in the fact that this is the problem and there are lots of ways that you can unpack it. You wanna follow that critical path. You wanna recognize that opportunities are likely to be incremental and you wanna focus uh, the actions that you take around reducing the barriers to change. You want to create and you want to be aware of conditions that enable your uh, ability to move forward with the change narrative. And you got to be really tough at pursuing the fundraising uh, all the time and unwaveringly if you're going to get to the other end of it. Most important thing to remember about system change, it's not quick, it's not easy, and it's not cheap. But if you pay attention, you'll be able to uh, get where you need to go. That's it, thanks. Thanks Thank so much, Stuart and Chris. Really appreciate it. That was very interesting. Um, now I'd like to open the webinar up for questions and discussion. Remember, you can either send us your question or comment via the question box or go ahead and just raise your hand and we will call on you. And we really want this to be a, a discussion, so feel free to share you know, examples of your sewage-related work. We're here to learn from each other and um, we're always looking for ideas for the new sewage resources. So feel free to share. All right, so first question. And this is kind of gets at some of the summary you just gave, Stuart, and little um, your reflections. But knowing what you know now, if you could go back and do something differently, what would it be? I'll give an answer. Chris may have a different answer. My answer would be, I'd once I knew the scope of the problem, I'd probably go back and work harder and sooner on getting a dedicated funding source at the right scale. I'd put much more energy in doing that. Yeah, I, 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 I would agree. And I, I think it, um, you know, one of the other things is plans are really important. I mean, having, having a plan in place is so important so that when a downturn comes or an emergency comes and there's money that comes in to help bring the world back onto its feet that the, the plan is there for implementation so we're finally at that phase now but that long-term funding stream we probably had a chance at it a couple of years ago and and many people just didn't feel like we were ready and we didn't push hard enough and that's probably the only bit of regret i think Stuart and i really feel at this point in time and chris when you were just talking about what planning what specifically what what piece of it is it that long-term funding piece and what would well i think anything any plans that you um you know i think a lot of people you know when i when we deal with particularly smaller or lower levels of government, the, the, the villages, the, you know, 
municipalities that only have a couple of hundred or a couple of thousand homes or they're they're reluctant to draft a plan that they don't think they could implement and so they don't so they just ignore the problem entirely um what we've seen happen time and time again um, in this country um is when you have a crisis be a natural disaster um a, a pandemic um or or financial crisis um money appears out of wherever to get people back to work and to get communities back up and running and um the money goes to people who could raise a, a plan up in the air and say look here's something i really wanted to do but we just never had the opportunity to raise the funds to do so and um and those are the those are the people that get funding so you know if there was ever reluctance to pursue a planning process because you knew that the plan would result in something that was too expensive or too daunting to take on um you're going to miss out on that next big opportunity so the the, the planning processes should always move forward um, towards towards your goal of of you know addressing you know your ultimate problems um whatever they may be um ours just happens to be sewage pollution gotcha thanks okay so this is from a participant thank you for introducing us to the clean water septic technology what other technologies helped reduce nutrient pollution there there's a whole range and suite of technologies and they you know they will vary uh from where you are and and what the, this the you know the geologic geochemistry the geologic setting um the problem you're addressing so it could range from there's probably a dozen or so of those on-site um, septic system manufacturers all around the world um, there's a you know about six of them are performing really well here in Suffolk County and I think two of them probably have 75 percent of the market um, and that changes by geography there's 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 for whatever reason there's you know things that do better in different geographies. The ones that are taking off in Maryland are not the ones that are taking off here. Um, and it's just it's just regional participation by the manufacturers, I think. Um, but then there's a whole suite of um, other things that would probably fall. So those are source reduction strategies, um, sewering and on-site systems and water reuse um, are all you know source reduction strategies. And uh, whereas there's a whole range of mitigation type strategies uh, from permeable reactive barriers, which would be a, a vertical barrier that would intercept the groundwater flow before it enters the surface water. Um, there's impoundments and catch basins and stormwater practices that reduce nutrient pollution. And, uh, and then there's in the water nutrient uptake practices like macroalgae culture uh and aquaculture which um attempt to um take the nutrients that are in the water column already out of the water and create a usable product from it so there's you know there's there's a whole range of things depending upon uh what your geography calls for yeah, and, and a number of those technologies will be featured on the Reef Resilience Network Toolkit when those pages are shared. Um, so, so stay tuned for an overview of, of some of those tools available. Um, Kate, next question is about water quality results and have water quality results been measurable yet? Have you, how have you used the result? Um, the, the short answer is no. Right, we're still we're still in our infancy. Um, if we had, you know, the, the, we have an ongoing effort with a couple of. Uh, I showed you the example of Shelter Island. Um, you know, that would be our proof of concept if we could, um, you know, move the leadership in that town's government along with us. 
uh, we feel that that could be a great proof of concept because it is a small number of homes that would need to be um, upgraded. Um, it could be done for a relatively small amount of money in a short period of time. And, and then from there, we would hope to see a proof of concept. There has been anecdotal information where, um, you know, because that island is so reliant upon uh, wells, their own private wells, where um, one person installed a, a treatment unit and their neighbor's nitrate levels went down uh, a, a couple of years later. So it's, or, or less than a couple of years later, or, or even that the nitrate levels of the water entering into their home was higher than what was coming out of their treatment unit. So the technologies work and there's anecdotal evidence that the, the, there's proof in the groundwater that it's having impact, but at, at the ecosystem scale, we're, we just haven't hit that tipping point yet. Thanks, Chris. Okay, concerning this, concerning sewage pollution, which companies or groups were majorly causing sewage, and how did you convince them that the damage they were causing needed to be stopped or at least reduced significantly? I'm asking because in my experience, not many people want to change their systems, even when presented with a good cause or proof of damage. <laughs> You don't need to say their name specifically if that'll put you in a funny spot, but <laughs> well, there, there are uh, on Long Island, there are almost three million of them that are contributing to seventy percent of the nitrogen loading that's impacting our bays and harbors on average. So it really was a residential wastewater problem. Um, and the uh, of course, no one wants to change, and the barriers to change are many. And that for us was how we put together our critical path. We said, well, what are the barriers to change? There's no money, the regulations don't allow it. We don't have any idea how much we actually need to change in order to get the response from the system that we want. Uh, so all of those questions had to be dealt with. The biggest impediment for making the change turns out to be in the regulatory environment and in the economic environment. If you can change the regulations, and provide money so that people don't get punished for doing something that, that was okay when they did it, then you can actually move, move the needle and begin to get change. But it is certainly difficult. And uh, a giant uh, Rubik's cube in terms of trying to align all the pieces. Chris, anything to add? Yeah, you know, I think nobody wants to be labeled the polluter, right? Even even those who even deny the that it's a problem, don't they don't want to be labeled as the polluter. They don't want to be labeled as the inhibitor to change. But at the same time, uh they also don't want to rip up their front yard or whatever for a couple of days to be part of the solution. So, you know, getting the you know, it, I think it's a societal thing where, where once you see change happening and you see it happening at scale, more people jump in, right? So it's like solar or, you know, you, you, know, you, you see, I, it happened in my own neighborhood where um, we upgraded our system here at our house, our neighbor upgraded theirs the next day. And, you know, it no longer became, oh, something happened at that one person's house. Uh, and people stop by and said, "Oh, I thought about doing that. Yet yeah, I'm going to finish the process now," and 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 it and it and it kind of took off in this one little road, um, small road at that. But the um, that's how change happens, you know, somewhat incrementally and and in little fits and spurts, where um, people see themselves as part of the solution and that it wasn't so bad when they see other people go through it. So if you can make it easy, um, people are willing to do it. But the, if it's if there's too many obstacles in their way, too much paperwork, the you know the, the the installer didn't do a nice job cleaning up the property when they left, 
um, that'll all all those little things will will throw the monkey wrench in the process and and inhibit change. Yeah, and it just um, really for the folks who weren't able to be on the first part one webinar. Um, Hearing some of the things that Chris and Stewart did for in terms of you know the social science research that they did to uncover, you know, learn more about the audiences they were trying to reach, identify what those barriers to action are, and then creating a plan to try and create, you know, encourage that incremental change that you know didn't happen organically. It was very intentional and um, pulling from a lot of lessons learned from social marketing and the idea of social norms and if you see your neighbor doing something you know there's kind of that tipping point where momentum starts to grow um, and we do have a number of resources on the reef resilience network about social marketing and also strategic communication planning um, many of the things that Kristen Stewart have mentioned we also highlight in that planning process in our work um, did you want to say something Chris well know. yeah so uh, I think in in one particular bay on the south shore of Nassau County, which is the the county closest towards New York City, uh, there is a series of uh, there's one really big sewage treatment plant that has an outfall into a, a, a very restricted bay and and a couple of other smaller ones that also feed into that bay. And so the county was responsible for those plants. And and like I said, nobody wants to be the big polluter, but they also couldn't afford to upgrade it on their own. So the problem just got worse for decades. So, so that's been a solution about two decades in the making at this point. And, um, and it wasn't until Superstorm Sandy came and wiped that plant, the, the biggest of those plants out thoroughly enough that they had to start over. And um, again, this is one of those things where they had intentions to fix the place for decades. They just never had the money. And so it just got worse and worse and worse until one big storm just inundated the whole facility and wiped it out. Now that plant is on track to, it's already upgraded and up to the capacity where it's reducing nitrate by 40%. They just broke ground the other day on a side stream process, which will bring the treatment level up to about 70 to 80% nutrient removal. Um, and then, and they've begun reusing a lot of the, some of the water as well. And then they're also transforming some of the other smaller treatment plants that also contributed to that one tidally restricted bay into pump stations so that they could feed into the now modernized plant. And then once that that modernization is fully transformed, it, there'll be an ocean outfall of the clean water to to get that that effluent out of that bay. So there's an instance where maybe in five years from now we could see a 99% reduction of nutrients to an embayment and actually see massive ecological response in the in the in the in a short period of time. So, um, whomever asked me that question, let's let's talk in a couple of years. And my guess is there'll be fishing and shell fishing in that bay again. So I was reminded of a wonderful quote from Milton Friedman that has been an inspiration to me, and that sort of perfectly describes our circumstances as we grapple with um, nitrogen pollution. Friedman wrote in 1989. Only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. That, I believe, is our basic function, to develop alternatives to existing policies, to keep them alive and available until the politically impossible becomes the politically inevitable. If that isn't a perfect description for what we do, I don't know what is. <laughs> and inspiring. Um, we think we have time for one last question here. Um, you mentioned that you use the critical path thought exercise instead of theory of change. 
Can you explain why you went with the critical path and perhaps share resources on how to conduct that process? So the, the theory of change is a, a bunch of if then clauses. And um, if we do this, then this happens. If that happens, then this happens. And then we get where we want to go. So it, 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 for our purposes, was too um, big. Uh, and it made us come at the problem from a perspective that was like at 50,000 feet in elevation rather than 10 feet in elevation. So we went at it from the point of view of barriers. What are the things that we don't know about, where we need information? What are the things that are blocking us? And then incrementally, what could we do to unpack those blockers into tiny steps that might remove them as blocks? So it's slightly different from a theory of change in that uh, it really tries to reduce it down to a set of possibilities. They're not if-then clauses. They are, um, an, they are a, uh, a bundle of possibilities, any one of which begins to crack open the challenge that you're confronting. So I don't have any wonderful referent for doing a critical path exercise, but if anybody wants to try one, I'd be more than happy to facilitate or to offer a few guiding principles in writing. Tell me what the problem is and I'll jump in. Oh, that's a big offer. I was okay. to say, watch okay. what you say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll um, learn something by helping other people build out a critical path. So I'm, I'm more than happy to continue my own lessons here. Um, and maybe I'll just sneak in one more question, but just a good way to to end, but of all the things that have happened, what would you say is the single most important thing that led you down the path of success? If you could pick one. Wow. You know, the, for me, the, the big transformational moment was getting the state of New York to step up to the plate and say, you guys need to make a nitrogen action plan. When they funded the Long Island Nitrogen Action Plan, that was activation energy at a key moment where we felt like there's just no way we can unpack that. Chris, what was it for you? So I, I might actually go back even further which uh, to my, my time as a marine biologist or marine scientist with the Nature Conservancy before I became the water quality guy to a, a series of reports region-wide from Long Island North to Cape Cod, Massachusetts, looking at seagrass. And it was our last, last ditch effort to think of habit, preserving habitats the, kind of the way they are. And, you know, we, we looked at everything from genetics to temperature stress to, um, to nitrate in the leaves, in the blades of the grass. And it was just, it was, that was a little bit of data that put us over the edge of, okay, we really have to do something about this. And, and it's not just us. Um, there's nitrogen pollution in our waters and it's coming from human waste. Um, we, we have to do something about this if we want these ecosystems to persist. And that that literally changed my career. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. And I am sorry to have to wrap up the discussion, but we've come to the end of our hour. We continue or encourage you to continue the conversation on the Reef Resilience Network discussion forum. It's our interactive community, our online community of managers and experts from around the world uh, to join the ocean sewage pollution discussion. There's a, a link on the screen. We'll go ahead and, and chat that to you as well. And um, we ask for your participation at the end of the webinar. So in just one moment, um, you'll get a prompt to take a survey and we'd love your feedback on this webinar and on the topic of sewage and what you're interested in learning about next. Our next webinar, not sewage related, and, but it's in a couple days, is November 20th and that is evaluating success and restoration. 
It'll be a discussion with experts from the Coral Restoration Consortium's Monitoring Working Group, and they'll be giving an overview of their new publication, Coral Reef Restoration Monitoring Guide, Methods to Evaluate Restoration Success from Local to Ecosystem Scales. So we hope you'll join us on the 20th for that webinar on restoration. And thank you again, Chris and Stuart, for, for sharing the Long Island sewage story and taking time during these two webinars to give us a deeper dive and behind the scenes look on, on what you've done to, to shift the, the conversation on water and water quality and ocean sewage pollution in Long Island. So big thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Mm -hmm.